In chapter two, we're going to be talking about growth and conflict. Growth as we grow as, as we try to tear ourselves apart. So what we have right here is... So this new book kind of puts many different decades together in one chapter. And so what we have here is the War of 1812. It is referred to as the Second War of Independence by the United States historians, simply because it was, again, fought with Great Britain. Uh, its colonies in the West Indian allies of North America. The outcome resolved many issues which became, which remained from the American War of Independence, but involved no boundary changes. The United States declared war in 1812 for several reasons, including trade restrictions brought about by Britain's continuing war with France, the imprisonment of American merchant sailors, that's called impressment, they would impress you and force you, they would kidnap you off of a boat and then make you serve in their navy. So um, that's one of the things. And you could see American nationalism and economic nationalism. American nationalism was the era of good feelings. In this era, uh, era, which is a time period, Americans were more loyal to the United States rather than a particular state or region. So not Georgians, but Americans. There was harmony and national uh, in politics. Republicans realized that a stronger federal government was advantageous. Economic nationalism? What did it do, or what did it do to them? Uh, created a new national bank. Um, you can listen to Hamilton about that. Protecting American manufacturers from foreign competition and building canals and roads to improve transportation uh, and link the country together. The second bank, the War of 1812, was very expensive. The government had to pay highest rates on loans. Uh, in response, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina proposed a bill to pass the second bank of the U.S. in 1816. Uh, this gave the bank the ability to issue notes that would serve as currency. The second bank could control the banks. So I bet you've always wanted to know about tariffs and transportation. In the eyes of the Republican Party, protecting manufacturers was a big deal. In order to make an effort to do this, the tariff of 1816 was levied. This tariff was a protective tariff that was designed to nurture American manufacturers by taxing imports to drive up their prices. The, Ameri uh, the government also wanted to improve the nation's transportation system. Originally, the idea was vetoed by President Madison, the shortest president. However, soon after the, uh, that road and canal uh, construction began. So, judicial nationalism. Why was this important? Chief Justice Marshall ruled in three important cases that established the dominance of the, uh, of the nation over states that shaped the future of American government. So you see those three cases there. So basically what that's saying is that the federal government has more power than the state government. Okay? The federal is, you know, the capital is in Washington, D.C. Martin versus Hunter's Lessee. Uh, in this famous court case, Dean Martin or Denny Martin tried to sell land in Virginia inherited from his uncle, Lord Fairfax, a loyalist during the war. Virginia law said no enemy could inherit land. The Supreme Court ruled that Virginia's law conflicted with the 1783 Treaty of Paris. This helped establish the Supreme Court as the nation's final court of appeal. Now, I'm going to go on, and um, if you have any questions about any of these other cases, please contact me. I'm just trying not to make this too very long. Nationalist diplomacy. Why is it important? A wave of nationalism with Congress and among voters influenced the nation's foreign affairs as well. Under President Moreau, the United States expanded its borders and asserted itself on the world stage. So, Andrew Jackson invaded Florida. Believe it or not, Florida was still controlled by Spain at this point. Southern states wanted to remove Spain from their area. Slaves were escaping to Florida after being warned by the Seminoles, who are the Creek people, they're Native American, to stay out of Florida. Andrew Jackson invaded, removed the Spanish governor, and destroyed Seminole villages. John Quincy Adams forced Spain in, uh, to decide that Florida was causing them too many problems and that they weren't controlling the area well. So Spain gave Florida the United States in the adams onis Treaty of 1819. Eventually it became the 27th state. So we decided on the Monroe Doctrine. It stated that American continents were henceforth not to be considered the subjects of any future colonizing by an, any American power. So you can see the Western Hemisphere in that map to the left. This was an extremely bold act because the U.S. may not have been able to back up its new policy if challenged. Think about this. 
Just a few years before, even uh, before European nations enjoyed the ability of conquering many native nations in North and South America. Now the U.S. was saying this practice was forbidden. The doctrine was used during 1962 when Russia placed missiles in Cuba. If European countries were to try to colonize or invade any part of Western Hemisphere, that would be considered an act of aggression. Now that we're in control of this massive landmass, we need to transport things from one side to the other, or at least the portions that we're in control of. A revolution in transportation, roads and turnpikes. Why is it important? If a country is well connected to its parts, it has better economic control and defense. As early as 1806, uh, the U.S. started a transportation revolution when the National Road was built. Soon after, in 1811, laborers were cutting the roadbed westward from the Potomac River at Cumberland, Maryland. The National Road would be the last road funded by federal government for several years. States and cities started laying down thousands of miles of road that included toll charges, steamboats, and canals. So rivers offered a much faster way to transport good. With this unique style of transportation, steamboats started uh, being constructed to transport the goods. The breakthrough came with Robert Fulton developed the first commercially successful steamboat and Robert Livingston took the Clermont 150 miles up the Hudson River to Albany in only 32 hours. By 1850, over 700 steamboats called riverboats traveled along the nation's waterways. Due to the growth of the river travel, many canals started being built throughout the country. By 1840, more than 3,300 miles of canals snaked through the nation, creating a new economic growth. The Iron Horse, Peter Cooper built the American version of the British steam engine. So, you know, you apply steam heat to get power, um, whether it's on water or on land. In the 1800s, train systems started popping up throughout the country. This movement became very popular. The main reasons were due to the fact that the trains could transport people and goods much faster than a stagecoach. Trains could also travel virtually anywhere track was laid, which eventually would help settle the West. So all of this information brings about new systems of production. Industrialization sweeps the North. Uh, the definition of industrialization is the process of which a society or country or world transforms itself, primary from agricultural, where you grow things, society, into one based on manufacturing goods and services, where you make things, so growth to make. Industrialization took off in the 1800s. Beginning in the 1830s, many states encouraged industrialization by passing several incorporation laws. Industrialization started in the Northeast, where many streams provided factories with water power. In 1840, scores of textile factories had been built in the Northeast. You know the Northeast, New York, Maine, those areas. Industry soon applied factory techniques to the production of lumber, shoes, leather, wagons, and other products. Francis Lowell introduced mass production for cotton cloth in the United States. Technological advances. The nation's industrial growth was aided by technological advances. People like Eli Whitney explained the value of interchangeable parts. He came up with the cotton gin, which combed seeds out of cotton, which apparently is very difficult to do and allows a machine to do it instead of a human. Using this process, machines turned out large quantities of identical process uh, pieces. Communication involved as well, uh, in, communication improved as well with Samuel B. Morris. See that Morris code over there to the right and his telegraph began working on the telegraph and developed Morris code, code for sending messages. The rise of large cities with the growth of industry, the population rapidly shifted. Many jobs pulled people out of the country where they were working on farms and pulled them into the cities. By 1820, many city populations had doubled or even tripled. Workers began to organize. Why? Because they needed protection from, you know, people that were giving them bad hours, bad, you know, conditions. People that worked in factories in the 1800s had a hard life and long hours and terrible work conditions. Many children were first to work. Their small size was often an advantage uh, to certain industries. In coal mining, children fit into smaller holes. Labor unions were groups of workers that joined together to improve their situations. If, were, if groups of workers joined together, they had more power. And the family farm believed it, the country's leading economic activity was farming because of the numbers, even though people were moving. It employed many more people and produced more wealth than any other work. I think that's the answer to a question. So, as you can see by the graph to the left, it should say, the rural population country grew by more than 20 million people from 1810 to 1870. 
How do you know this? In 1810, it is about 6 million, but by 1870, the population is 29 million. Subtract 6 from 29 and see the growth rate. Using this equation, how much did the urban city population grow by? A little bit of math in your history class, huh? During this time of invention, many patents were issued. A patent is a set of exclusive rights grant, uh, granted by a sovereign state to an inventor to their assignee. You probably have seen this on Shark Tank. Yeah, when they say patent pending, that means they're waiting for the patent to come through, and they're really hoping it comes through to them. Now we're on a slide where I know this picture is found within your questions, and it could be South Carolina where the slaves exceed the white population, but I'm not entirely sure. Society in the South. In Southern society, the planters were at the tops of social classes. These people had 20 or more enslaved people. The next class was the yeoman farmers. This group of farmers was like the middle class and made up a vast majority of the white population. This group of people may have had four or fewer enslaved persons, but most... Uh, uh, had none at all. Near the bottom of society were the rural poor. These people usually lived on land too barren for successful farming. At the bottom of society were African Americans who were used primarily as slaves. In 1850, nearly 3.5 million African Americans lived in the South, making up for about 37% of the population. African Americans' legal status. Aside from enduring the lifetime of bondage, enslaved persons had few legal rights. Slave codes forbade enslaved men and women from owning property or leaving slaveholders' premises without permission. Free African Americans. Not all African Americans were enslaved. In 1850, some 225,000 free African Americans resided in the South. Some of these slaves even raised in the northern part of the southern states, mainly Virginia and Maryland. Another 196,000 free African Americans lived in the North where slavery was outlawed. However, they were not exactly embraced there. And now, remember that amazing thing I told you about, the cotton gin by Eli Whitney? Here it is. So the gin really is in gin, and many different times in your life you're studying history. It was developed by Eli Whitney. The cotton gin is a machine that quickly and easily separates cotton fibers from their seeds, allowing for much greater productivity manual than manual cotton separation. The fibers are processed into clothing and other cotton goods, and any undamaged seeds may be used to grow more cotton and produce cotton oil and meal and stuff like that. So there's an actual picture of it. So, of course, there were African-American revolts during this time. Uh, let's read about Nat Turner was an African-American slave who led a slave rebellion in Virginia in 1831 that resulted in 55 white deaths. Whites responded with at least 100 black deaths. He gathered supporters from South Half Hampton County, Virginia. Turner was convicted, sentenced to death, and hanged. In the aftermath, the state executed 56 blacks accused of being a part of Turner's slave rebellion. 200 blacks were also killed after being beaten by white militias and mobs reacting with the violence. Across Virginia and other southern states, state legislature passed laws prohibiting education of slaves and free blacks, restricting rights of assembly and other civil rights for free blacks, and requiring white ministers to be present at black worship services. Slavery and vicious hate crimes continued possibly because President Andrew Jackson's vocal advocacy of against abolition. So Solomon Northrup was a freeborn African American from Saratoga Springs, New York. And this is a good movie. I used to show my students at Bonanza and um, then they remade it and they used, uh, you know, they just brought about, I don't know, I forget what year it came out, but it was pretty fantastic. So he was born in New York. He played the um, violin or the fiddle, whatever you want to call it. And he was stolen and kidnapped and sold into slavery in Louisiana where he lived for 12 years in bondage until he was finally freed. Uh, January 1853, he was one of very few to do, so in, uh, to do so in such cases. Held in the Red River region of Louisiana by several different owners, he got news to his family who contacted friends to elicit the New York governor in this case. New York State had passed a law in 1840 to recover African American residents who had been kidnapped and sold into slavery. So all of this used to be in a different chapter, but we have to look at the Missouri Compromise because it's exactly that, a compromise, and that doesn't seem to be happening much in Washington these days. The Missouri Compromise prohibited slavery in the former Louisiana Territory, north of the parallel of 36 degrees um, 
and 30 degrees north, except within the boundaries of the proposed state of Missouri. The major issue faced when Missouri was applying for statehood was the fact that the country was debating whether slave states should expand westward. With the nation standing at 11 free states and 11 slave states, the entrance of a new state would upset the balance in the Senate and the political power. To solve this problem, Maine, which had always been part of Massachusetts, applied for statehood as well. When this happened, Maine was brought into the Union as a free state, allowing Missouri to join as a slave state. So we often see some of that power in the way that it looks these days between political parties rather than states. So resurgence of sectionalism. What is sectionalism? In national politics, sectionalism is loyal to the entrance of one's own region or section of the country rather than to the country as a whole. Uh, it is often a precursor to separatism, meaning let's separate based upon our section of the United States. So you can see those pictures to the far right, the north, the south, and the west. The election of 1824, all candidates were Republican. I know, a little bizarre. Henry Clay of Kentucky, John Quincy Adams. Yes, his dad was John Adams of Massachusetts, William Crawford of Georgia, and Andrew Jackson of Tennessee. The results were that Jackson had the most popular vote, but no candidate won the majority in the Electoral College. What happens now? Well, according to the Constitution, the vote goes to Congress. Clay was eliminated due to the least votes. Clay was a Speaker of the House and would now vote for one of the three remaining candidates. Isn't that crazy? He hated Jackson and gave support to Adams, who won 13 votes to Jackson's seven votes and Crawford, Crawford's four votes. So the election of 1824 was with a winner was John Quincy Adams. The election of 1828 was based was between Jackson and Adams, and Jackson won both the popular and the electoral college votes. All of this is driving us towards what will eventually be the Civil War, and that's kind of the point. This is the lead up to it. So Growing, sec uh, growing division and reform, states expand voting rights. In the early 1800s, hundreds of thousands of Americans, mostly white men, gained the right to vote. This was due to the fact that many states lowered or eliminated property ownership as a qualification to vote. So if you live a rental property right now, you would not be allowed to vote even if you were 18 years old or 21 as it used to be. People's uh, the people's president. In 1829, Andrew Jackson became president, elected in 1828 The United States uh, of the United States. States. Many of Jackson's votes came from the residents of the frontiers in the West and the South. Jackson was very well liked for his average personality and for being a self-made man. Jackson had very little education and earned most of his success strictly on hard work. Although Jackson is well known for having a temper and taking parts in duels to prior to entering the White House, he became a man of dignity and much calmer once he took office. The spoil system. Mm, this is terrible. We still see it. Jackson strongly supported the spoil system, which appointed people to government jobs based on the party loyalty and support. Jackson was the first president to force out large numbers of government employees in order to appoint his own followers. Jackson considered the spoil system to be truly democratic, allowing more ordinary citizens to work for the government. If that was the case and it wasn't just based upon loyalty, then that probably would be true. A more open electoral system. A move by Jackson supporters to make the election process more democratic instead of using the traditional caucus system to elect presidential candidates, Jackson and his supporters believed that the national nominating convention would work more effectively, excuse me, efficiently. They also believed this would allow more people than just the elite to have a chance in office. This made the election of 1828 one with many new voters. The nullification process, the debate over nullification. In the early 1800s, South Carolina had a weakened economy and many residents thought it was due to tariffs being passed by the government. Tariffs are kind of like taxes, remember? The situation became so bad that South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union. John C. Calhoun, who was from South Carolina and was vice president, put forth an idea of nullification, meaning the states had the right, has the right to declare a federal law null or not valid since they created the federal union because the states had created the federal union, which was apparently typed twice. Jackson defends the Union. Jackson was adamant about defending the Union. After Jackson was quoted saying, our federal Union must be preserved, 
which angered John Calhoun, Congress passed another tariff law that significantly cut tariffs. South Carolinians were still not satisfied. Jackson considered the nullification an act of treason. Policies towards Native Americans. Now this is where he's going to slip a lot. Jackson, like many Westerners at the time, wanted to move Native Americans to the Great Plains. Many Americans believed the Great Plains were a wasteland and would never be settled. The idea of moving Native Americans to the Great Plains would not put an end to the problem between the two groups. And so you can kind of see that just with that uh, Venn diagram there, the differences and what they shared in their ideals between Calhoun and Jackson. So we're getting closer to that war. Um, right now, if you look at here, the Wilmot Proviso or Proviso, David Wilmot, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, drafted a provision that would not allow slavery in the newly acquired Western lands after the war with Mexico. Many Southerners tried to block it in the House and the Senate, but it passed. The Proviso further separated North and South in their beliefs. Popular sovereignty was the resolution by Lewis Cass to allow each territory to decide if the new state wanted to have slavery. Obviously, slaves didn't get a chance to vote in this. The Free Soil Party emerges. The Free Soil Party opposed slavery in the free soil of the Western territories. Most of the members involved with the party wanted to preserve the Western state territories for white farmers. They felt that allowing slavery to expand would make it difficult for free men to find work. The party slogan summed up its vows, free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. It was created by Northern Whigs that disagreed with their party and separated joining an anti-slavery Democrats of New York. In 1848 election, this election featured candidates from the different parties. The Democrats were represented by Lewis Cass of Michigan, former President Martin Van Buren represented the Free Soil Party, and Zachary Taylor represented the Whig Party. When the votes were counted, Taylor won the election. The search for compromise. In California, there was a discovery of gold in 1848. By 1849, the 49ers moved to strike it rich. My NFL team, but that has changed. This population boom caused the need for government. This meant that California wanted to become a state. The great debate begins. During the time California was set to enter the union, the great debate was set off. Many Southerners feared feared that California entered the Union as a free state, that the slave states would lose power in national politics and become a minority in the Senate. Henry Clay of Kentucky proposed three solutions that offered concessions to both sides. Despite the proposals, it was Senator John C. Calhoun that darkly predicted secession for the South. The Compromise of 1850. Originally, Congress did not pass Clay's bill due to the fact that President Taylor opposed it. Taylor's successor, Vice President Millard Fillmore, supported the compromise. After Clay stepped down, he handed the reins to the younger Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas does a famous debate with Lincoln in a little bit. The bill passed and President Fillmore signed it into law. The Compromise of 1850 was only effective for a short time, however, and the hope of permanent solution through compromise would, be get, would quickly fade. So in the middle of this time, there was a reform spirit. The Second Great Awakening, the new religious groups emerge, American writers emerge, and the Penny Press. The Penny Press was a way, this was a way, unique machine that allowed mass qualities, quantities of newspapers to be printed at the time, made penny papers that were a cheap way to share news and gossip ideas, kind of like the internet blog of today, and utopian societies. So I'm going to kind of blow over this just a little bit because our uh, presentation is going to become long. So what we have here on the next page is the reform spirit. And this concept basically comes from the idea that temperance is the, you know, don't drink anymore. And then prison reform was how to reform the prisons and the way that they could look in a different way so that people were punished in different ways. It was the creation of penitentiaries, though, that they came out of this. Um, it allowed this individuals would work to achieve penance or remorse. Educational reform. Um, 1800s reformers pushed to increase the level of our public education and education was paid for by the government. So obviously before this your parents paid whether it was trade or whatever that's what happened and then women started to become more educated because prior to this women were not very educated other than in the homes and what they needed to do within the homes. And then of course this the early women's movement 
true womanhood was the idea that a woman should be homemakers and should take responsibility for developing their children's character. But Catherine Beecher was a strong advocate of this notion and wrote a book that proposed women could have fun at home and gave instructions on child care, cooking, and health ma uh, matters. But women wanted to do more outside of the home. So uh, you'll start to see the idea that they wanted to vote during this time. Unfortunately, that does not come around until 1920. So we're way far away from that. And suffrage is the idea that women could vote. They're not suffering, it's suffrage, the right to vote. Please get that straight. So what we have here are the African-American abolitionists. In the abolitionist movement, many free African-Americans were still enduring a lot of prejudice in the North. During this time, African-American abolitionists named Frederick Douglass published uh, pushed for an end to slavery. Douglass, who escaped slavery, delivered a passionate message and speeches. Also, there's going to be Sojourner Truth, which we will visit in a later slide. Frederick Douglass was a slave. He was born in Maryland and escaped to Massachusetts, where he began a career of giving a rousing impromptu speech on anti-slavery convention in Nantucket, Massachusetts. He was a brilliant thinker and electrifying speaker. I appear before the immense assembly this evening as a thief and a robber. I stole this head, these limbs, this body from my master and ran off with them. So you can see the play of sectionalism, slavery, and tariffs, which is, you know, the idea of them being punished are all playing together, which will come into this perfect storm of the Civil War. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a best-selling book of its time in 1852. Author Harriet Beecher Stowe, an abolitionist, wrote a story of a man's life as a slave. It informed Northerners about what was happening in the South, and it made Southerners very angry. You can go ahead and look at a few quotes there, and you can see the pictures to the right. The Fugitive Slave Act came out at this time. The act's inflammatory effects, well, under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a person claiming that an African American had escaped from slavery had only to point out that person as a runaway slave and take him or her into custody. African Americans accused of being fugitives had no right to trial and were uh, not allowed to testify in court. So the northern resistance grows. Many northerners that were already outraged started to become defiant and the thought of capturing runaway slaves for southerners. Northern resistance became frequent, public, and sometimes violent. While most northerners did not approve of slavery, they did fear the consequences of the abolitionist movement. Now, you guys might not have heard much, but I'm pretty positive you heard about the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, of course, we hear of Harriet Tubman, and that is the person that they would like to replace on the 20, or replace, place on the $20 bill. Um, one of the myths is that she uh, actually helped 300 people, when in reality she only helped about 70. But think about those 70 people being a drop in a lake with a rock, and all of those effects, the ripple effects that go on from there with those 70 individuals turns into absolutely thousands. The Underground Railroad was an informal yet well-organized system that was legendary during the 1830s. It helped thousands of slaves, enslaved persons escaped. Members of the Underground Railroad were called conductors. These people transported runaways north in secret, gave them shelter and food along the way, and saw them to freedom in the northern states or Canada with some money and a fresh start. Harriet Tubman was known as Moses for leading many of the slavery using the system of hideouts. Maine was a slave's was the state at the northernmost part of the railroad. And yes, when I was a kid, I really thought the Underground Railroad was a railroad that was underground. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 may have been the single most significant event leading to the Civil War. By the early 1850s, settler, settlers and entrepreneurs wanted to move into the area known as Nebraska. However, until the area was organized as a territory, settlers would not move there because they could not legally hold a claim on the land. The southern states' representatives in Congress were in no hurry to permit the Nebraska Territory to become the land lay north of the 36th parallel where slavery had been outlined by the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Just when things between the north and the south were in an uneasy balance, Kansas and Nebraska opened fresh wounds. The person behind the Kansas-Nebraska Act was Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois. He said he wanted to see Nebraska made into a territory and to win Southern support proposed that the Southern state inclined to support slavery. It was Kansas. Underlying it was his desire to build transcontinental railroad to go through to Chicago. The Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed each territory to decide the issue of slavery on the basis of popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is the idea of states' rights over federal rights, and many say that that was the entire large cause of the Civil War. 
Bleeding Kansas was the name given to the state of Kansas due to the territorial civil war between pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers in that state. By the end of 1856, 200 people had died in fighting and $2 million worth of property had been destroyed. Imagine how much that translates to. It's a lot of money. Um, the caning of Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner of Massachusetts Senator was an abolitionist, beaten beaten by Preston Brooks, a relative of Senator Andrew Butler, a man that Sumner had insulted in an anti-slavery rant. Brooks beat Sumner with a cane and left him lying bloody on the floor of his office. Many Southerners considered Brooks a hero and some even sent him canes. Shocked by the attack and outrage for the Southern support of Brooks, Northerners strengthened their determination to resist slavery. We've already discussed these two ladies previously in a different side, so I'm not going to read a ton about them, but you can hear, of course, Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, and we did discuss the um, railroad. This is just a little bit more information on their lives. Okay, so here what we have is a breakdown of what's happening. The birth of the Republican Party. So the Republicans organized, created by people that were discontented from the other parties, mostly over slavery. The Republicans were born out of anger over allowing the Kansas-Nebraska Act to pass. They were against slavery in the territories, similar to Jefferson's original ideas during the revolutionary time of not wanting the United States to become a monarchy. Republicans united because they feared that the Southern planters were becoming an autocracy or aristocracy that controlled the federal government. The Know Nothings was a party of anti-Catholic and nativist parties. The party opposed immigrations, particularly Catholic immigration, into the United States. Eventually, the Know Nothing Party would be absorbed by the Republican Party. Okay, so you can see the winner of the 1856 election was James Buchanan, a Democrat, and you can see that John C. Fremont ran, and you know that because of Fremont Street. He was the Republican. Once again, there were three parties that had representatives in the election. The Republicans nominated John C. Fremont's. The Democrats nominated James Buchanan, the man that had served as an ambassador to Russia and Great Britain, as well as serving in Congress for 20 years. The American Party, hoping to attract the vote of former Whigs, nominated former President Millard Fillmore. With the votes recounted, James Buchanan had won the election. Sectional division grows in the Dred Scott decision of March of 1857. The United States Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice Robert Taney, declared that all blacks, slaves as well as free, were not and could not ever become United States citizens. So as you know, there are growing tensions, and so we have John Brown's raid on October 16, 1859. John Brown led a small army of 18 men into a small town of Harpers Ferry, Virginia. His plan was to instigate a major slave rebellion in the South. He would seize the arms and ammunition in the federal arsenal, arm slaves in the area, and move south along the Appalachian Mountains, affecting slaves to his co attracting slaves to his cause. He had no rations. He had no escape route. His plan was doomed from the very beginning, but it did succeed to deepen the divide between the North and the South. Soon after Brown's raid had started, he was tried and convicted and sentenced to death. Many Northerners viewed Brown as a martyr, as a, no, in a noble cause. He strengthened the abolitionist feeling in the North, and Southerners realized that this raid proved Northerners were actively plotting to murder slaveholders. So here we get to the election where the Republican Abraham Lincoln wins. The Democrats split in 1860. The debate over slavery in the Western Territory finally tore the Democratic Party apart. The split in the Democratic Party greatly improved Republicans' prospects, which was what some of the more radical Southern delegates had intended all along. They hoped a Republican victory would be the final straw that would convince the Southern states to secede. They wanted out. They didn't want to fix slavery, okay? Lincoln's elected, so he does win 1860. Uh, with no possibility of winning electoral votes in the South, the Republican turned to Abraham Lincoln, hoping he could sweep the North. Lincoln's debates with Douglas had made him very popular in the North, with the Democratic vote split between Douglas, who is advocating for popular sovereignty. That's states' rights, okay? So um, Lincoln-Douglas, those debates become famous, and now they're actually a piece of the debate team if you were at a regular school and did debate, okay? So here, the slavery division of states. The states are divided between slave and free, but there are more free states with some slave territories on the horizon to become states. The Civil War will begin April 12, 1861. So Lincoln's elected in 1860 within less than... Well, yeah, less than six months, there's a civil war. 
with the Confederates firing the fort, uh, shot at Fort Sumter. This is what the U.S. looked like at the beginning of the Civil War. Remember, Nevada's motto was battle-born for a reason. And then you could look at the division of states over here to the right. Who was Republican? Who was a Democrat? Who was a Southern Democrat? And who was considered constitutional union? So obviously compromise does fail because we did have a civil war. The Crittenses Compromise, where Congress tried to reinstate the Missouri Compromise, failed. And this was the final straw to leaving the Union. The last attempt at peace, Virginia, which was a slave state, proposed a peace conference. The conference was held in D.C. with delegates from 21 state, states present. None of the delegates in attendance were from the secessionist states. Very little progress was made during the final attempt. You can look over here at some of the pictures, Jefferson Davis, of course, being the president of the South, and of Abraham Lincoln being the president of what becomes the North. The founding of the Confederacy, while the delegates of the North met, so did the delegates of the South. Now, I know that this is a hot button topic, like when we slide to this next slide and you see this flag there, those are called the Stars and Bars and not the Stars and Stripes. And um, you see the president there uh, of this area. And then, of course, Robert E. Lee, who's the commander-in-chief in, or commander in kind of way of the, of the army down there. And that's what they're pulling all of those um, statues down for at this particular time. Of course, um, they didn't want to be told what to do. I mean, they're kind of like petulant teenagers. Sometimes you might find yourself there where you don't want to be told what to do because you're practically an adult or you're a young adult. You should legally be able to make your own decisions. And so that's the way the South felt. Yes, one of those topics was definitely slavery. They didn't want to be told what to do when it came to slavery. But at the same time, there were other topics involved. And you don't want to lose sight of everything in the whole picture as much as you can. That's Fort Sumter, and that's where those first sh shots were fired, which you will get in the next presentation. And then, of course, here is the final slide, a depiction of the firing at Fort Sumter.